Our idea for the mock-up was to really explore the ways that we might start to represent virtual materials through physical ones. What we really wanted to do was unpeel some of those layers and try to think about what a peeled apart virtual material might look like in the real world. So typically in virtual spaces, uh, materials are kind of paper thin, they don't really have any um, life behind what we see on the surface. So to begin to explore how we can actually transfer those qualities and start to look at all the ways that kind of depth and light and shadow might actually come into play in the physical was one of our key kind of drivers for this project. With working with Stowe, we had access to all of your scanned materials and all of the work that's been done to digitise all of the physical materials and finishes that are available. And so I think for us it was really interesting to also peel apart the layers and, and all of the, the kind of processing that goes into making those digital materials. So our ideas around the form and shape of the mock-up was to essentially bring together um, an, a feeling of an exterior and an interior within this kind of confine of the 1.2 by 1.2 by 1.2 cube. We also wanted to bring together typical junctions, so we have kind of floor to wall, we have a kind of window opening and a kind of idea of an overhang, and this allowed us to play with both rectilinear and curved surfaces as well, to apply these different materials to, which would really showcase the different ways in which they can be applied. I think what we wanted to express is that in virtual worlds and with virtual materials, you often don't see uh, what the build-up of the architecture is behind the surface and so we quite like the idea that again if we took that we had this sort of white section cut running through these junctions evoke something that is very has a clear physical presence but the boundary between the virtual and the real is, is sort of defined by this this kind of particular sort of junction in the finishes so I think we were really happy that it was possible to be able to achieve these kind of really sharp junctions between those finishes because that really evoked almost like someone had taken a chunk out of a kind of virtual building and then placed it in. Zuerst haben wir zum Beispiel den gekrümmten Überhang angepasst, der anfangs dreidimensional gekrümmt war, was bedeutet hätte, dass man dort eigentlich gar nicht mit dem Werkzeug in diese dreidimensionale Krümmung reinkommt. Also haben wir beschlossen, okay, wir machen nur eine Krümmung rein, so dass es auch beschichtbar ist mit unseren normalen Werkzeugen. Weitere Anpassung war in der Rücksprache auch mit UMP, welche Oberflächen wir austauschen, wenn zum Beispiel zwei raue Oberflächen an der Kante aufeinander getroffen wären, haben wir eine raue Oberfläche gegen eine feinere Oberfläche getauscht, um zu gewährleisten, dass wir dann auch dort auf dieser Kante im Schluss eine wirklich saubere Kante abbilden können. So here we have the materials that we used on the outside of the mock-up. So these are kind of meant to represent the material in its kind of finished form. So a physical material uh, similar to those that you might see in some of the sew case studies. So uh, on facades, on different buildings and so on. So we wanted to get a variation of colours, and a variation of finishes from the Stow signature rough um, material set. And then we have the materials that represent the inside of the mock-up, which are uh, supposed to represent the virtual materials. We wanted to kind of push how we could make these materials look kind of unreal in a way. And so we were kind of inspired by the different maps that, that uh, make up virtual materials. So for the flooring, we are very interested by the idea of the metallic map, which is a map which dictates how sort of shinier surface is. So we wanted to achieve this kind of really glossy flooring that would then reflect everything else in the interior of the piece. So you'd be able to see this kind of extremely sort of metallic and reflective floor. And then this, uh, this particular finish using the Stoverolit was inspired by what's called a normal map. So a normal map in, in kind of computer graphics is 
a map which shows how light bounces off a surface. So it enables you to take a flat surface and make it look kind of three-dimensional. And what's interesting is these maps are usually kind of light blue, purple and pink, and that's, that's how they communicate the, the different fall of light across things. So in order to do that, we've used a specially milled virilit, and we've used a series of kind of paint and metallic finishes in order to, to kind of evoke this quality. And I think it, it has this kind of feeling where you're not quite sure if you're looking at a render or a real material, which is really what we wanted to achieve with the finishes on the interior of the mock-up piece. And then to tie the virtual and the physical together, we used this bespoke render, and this is intended to represent a kind of ambient occlusion map, and we applied this to the section line, which would um, bring the two kind of palettes together. Yeah, and the ambient occlusion is kind of all about the internal shadowing within a surface and so we thought that this particular finish really kind of evokes that because you can see the way that shadow falls but also changes so much within the surface itself. For the colours, we saw the outside of the, the model as the kind of colour map, so in a virtual material that would be the layer that contains the colour. And so with that we want to explore some really vibrant colours to maybe just push how the systems can be kind of used and applied. Although the inside of the model is coloured, we kind of wanted it to sort of have no colour and actually to take the colours from the very particular maps that are used in digital materials. So we've used, obviously, the metallic map is this kind of black reflective floor. The normal map, which is made of stovirulet, takes on the, the kind of blue and purple of a normal map. And then the displacement map, which is using stow eco shapes, takes on the kind of grey colour of those particular maps. So although they're coloured, they're not, that, that's sort of more of a metaphor in relation to the, the, the way that virtual materials are actually kind of structured themselves. I think with any kind of designer that works on the screen, so game designers or architects rendering software, seeing things in RGB as you're designing, beginning to try to replicate that in reality can sometimes be a challenge. But I think more and more we see architects kind of being more vibrant and playful with their colour choices and perhaps this might be an influence of social media, you know, having kind of Instagrammable facades or walls or things that then make their way back onto the screen. So there could be an interesting dynamic between that and the way that that might inform material or colour choices as well. I think the big difference between um, maybe how we've made imagery in the past in architecture through rendering software and the game engine software which allows for real-time rendering is that you can then alter materials in real time as Sandra's saying. So if you want to look at a particular like paint application or finish um, to, to the products that you're looking at, you can do that, you can switch it on and off and you can kind of play with that quite quickly rather than waiting for a sample and that sample potentially being limited to a particular size, um, which is also really important to have on the table. Um, being able to kind of experiment with materials in real time as you're designing is an incredibly powerful and important tool. And I think in that respect, the digital materials have a lot of potential for, for trying out many different concepts and maybe pushing something in a direction you didn't initially imagine because it's, it's very, like time cheap in order to do that and with the, the quality of the game engine software's rendering nowadays you can get very close to kind of photorealism anyway so the, the gap between what you're experimenting with and the final thing that will arrive is, is not as large as it might have used to be which I think is really um, powerful for architects. Direkte Herausforderungen oder ähm, Schwierigkeiten gab es jetzt hier eigentlich gar nichts. In der Rücksprache mit UNP musste das Mockup hier und da ein bisschen angepasst werden. Von der Form her, was die Oberflächen an sich anging, gab es eigentlich gar keine Herausforderung, da UNP mit unseren PBA-Materialien gearbeitet haben. Und diese PBA-Materialien beruhen auf reellen Oberflächen von Stroh, die wirklich auch reell gescannt wurden und dann in PBA umgesetzt wurden. Von daher waren die Oberflächenerstellungen an sich überhaupt keine Herausforderung. 
I suppose one of the main things that goes missing between the, the digital and the physical is obviously the sense of touch, you know, understanding how warm or cold a material is, how soft it is. And, and so that's something that at the moment is quite difficult to replicate in, in the digital. I think the other thing is maybe how a material reacts to its surroundings. So how does it weather? How, does it, um, it, how is it affected by environmental changes and things like that? That's something that typically in virtual worlds like game worlds is not really something that's considered even if a material looks very accurate. Gaming has a lot of potential to influence architecture and also back and forth. So from playing video games over the years, they've always been um, design platforms in a way. So they've always been a way for users to be creative and to express their kind of inner desires, whether that's through kind of customization or coming together to kind of collaborate on participatory spaces. I think they've always had this relationship with architecture which could go even further. But I think maybe what's really interesting about platforms like Minecraft, for example, is that it, it's, it doesn't look realistic, but it, it's, it has a sort of quite a complex simulation of different material relationships. And so I think maybe that's, that's a space where there is um, quite a lot of potential for growth. So, for example, Stowe's real materials need to face up to environmental conditions and weathering and things like that, which is not necessarily normally included in a game world but there's no reason that it couldn't be because these, these softwares have the potential for very complex simulations. So potentially that's, that's a kind of space that might start to become really interesting in the future is not just to maybe visually represent materials but to also have a sort of simulated representation of how they react to the environment around them. With Digital Twins there's um, always this discussion of, of a complete simulation of reality. I think as Sandra says, human beings don't experience all of reality at the same resolution all the time. So I think there's definitely space for um, twins or simulations that really focus on like the granularity of a material experience. So we find it really interesting when they can take elements of reality and maybe exaggerate them or pull things out to um, analyse them at a greater detail or to accentuate them and games do that as well in a sense they're not always complete replicas of reality. So definitely there's the potential for digital twins that um, focus very closely on the sort of material experience of a space but it probably wouldn't be the same model that you make to work out the, the kind of traffic system of a city. Jeden Abend nach Abschluss meiner Arbeiten bin ich mit dem Smartphone nochmal um das Mock-up drumherum gelaufen, habe verschiedene Blickwinkel, Perspektiven abfotografiert, mir die dann auch abends auf der Couch nochmal angeschaut und dann habe ich auch gesehen, wie verschiedene Oberflächen wirken. Überrascht am meisten hat mich eigentlich, wie nah das 3D-Rendering an der Realität war. Des Weiteren hat mich wirklich begeistert das Studeco mit der Metallic-Beschichtung, die Geometrie, die Licht-Schattenwirkung davon und auch die Reflexion des studeco modells in dem glänzenden Fußboden. Das war nochmal so wirklich, wo ich gedacht habe, hey, das hätte ich jetzt so nicht erwartet. So I think for us working with Stowe on this project has hinted towards a kind of new form of dialogue that might emerge between um, designers or architects and those making the materials that can happen throughout the design process. You know, it was really nice to go back and forth between sketches, the resources that were available, the kind of digital materials library, lots of the samples and receive kind of updates on uh, the different ways that these sort of unreal or impossible finishes might be achieved as well, um, which hints towards, yeah, the potential for a, a really interesting form of dialogue that can exist between these different kind of groups. Having access to uh, Stowe's library of virtual materials was obviously like, really key to realising the project because it allows us to accurately test and visualise the, the design decisions that we're making. And I think that aligned with the fact that using game engine software we can kind of customise colours and finishes and things like that and, and explore lots of ideas. I think 
definitely hints at the or suggests a future where that's going to become much more embedded into a designer's practice that we have prior access to the materials before we have them made or we have samples made and we can really be very playful with the way that we engage with them and push the possibilities and then take them to Stowe and say can, can we realise that and hopefully we can and, and I think that that's been a, a kind of really interesting way of us working.